anything new change? I just set it up to record onto my laptop. Okay, perfect. I guess for those who are joining, if you want to introduce yourself in the chat, um, we'd love to know to know who you are, where you're where you're coming from, if you represent any community or organization or congregation. Okay, do you, do you want us to do it verbally or in the chat? Um, well, you're already talking verbally and we and it's before six, go ahead. Okay, hi, I'm Clarence Edwards. Um, I am with Unity Fellowship Jamaica Ministries. Mm. And we have, um, we're part of the uh, Unity Fellowship Church movement. We have churches throughout the United States, all over the country, um, from New York to Los Angeles. And we are the first international outreach. Um, we have several safe houses in Jamaica. And we just opened up a new um, house in Rialto for immigrants that may be coming to the United States and they have nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have set up a program there in Rialto, which is in the Inland Empire, to house. We have, I think our capacity is like nine people mm -hmm. and um, we can house them for up to a year and help them with whatever they need to socialize themselves into this culture, help them with their papers and so on and so on and so on, get jobs, whatever they need. That's what we're going to try to help them with. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing. Thank you. Welcome. Great. Thank well, you. Well. Um, excuse me, Reverend Clarence. Um, do you mind dropping your um, email address in the chat? I am the Inland Empire Faith Organizer, and I would love to um, connect with you. Okay. Uh, let me see, 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 see. Okay. Larry, I'll, I'll let you, since it's six o'clock, I'll let you do your official welcome. and. Okay. That's six six o'clock, so uh, let's get started. I uh, want to welcome each of you, everyone, to um our faith rooted 2024 advocacy campaign and uh we want we are delighted to have have you with us tonight um uh, we know that there are a number of things that you could be doing uh and uh, perhaps this is outside of your normal schedule but we're grateful that you took the time out to join us tonight uh we hope to have an in, uh, inspiring engaging and informative uh time tonight uh, you will be able to hear from some good speakers, some of our guest speakers tonight. You will also have an opportunity uh, to share your thoughts, some of your reflections. But again, we just want to uh, welcome you. Uh, as a person of faith uh, like you, uh, like many of you, uh, I believe in the power of prayer. I come from a tradition uh, that is deeply rooted in prayer. In fact, if you go to uh, uh, African-American church, uh, it is highly likely that when you uh, have what they typically call, call in most uh, African-American churches, altar call, you will hear uh, perhaps the pastor or the person who's leading in the prayer uh, say that prayer changes things. Uh, and um, I, I believe that I do that, believe that prayer changes things. But I'm also a pragmatist. And that is to say that uh, while prayer uh, changes things, we also must advocate and work for the change that we desire to see. So in saying that is is that 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 I believe that you have to combine prayer and public policy advocacy because it's put through public policy advocacy, especially in the United States social political uh, context uh, that we create change and we make the change that we need. So prayer and public policy. Uh, tonight, hopefully, you will hear about uh, some advocate. You will hear about some advocacy ca campaigns that we are undertaking, and that we are going to need your prayers and your support, uh, and uh, for you to join us uh, to uh, help bring about the change that we need, especially when it comes to the area of decarceration and detention. Uh, with that said, I'd like to open up with just a brief prayer, and then we will uh, proceed uh, with uh, our uh, meeting. Uh, will you join me in just a brief word of prayer? 
uh, holy and righteous one, we welcome you into our presence. Uh, we thank you for life, for health, and for strength. I thank you for the people on this call and for those who are even joining now. I pray blessings upon them. We pray blessings upon uh, their households. We remember and call forth uh, in our midst tonight. Uh, we are mindful of the houseless. We are mindful of those who uh, are hungry. We are mindful of those who, who, who are afraid and in fear of their life uh, because bullets and bombs are flying over their heads. We pray, God, for all marginalized people. We pray for those who are vulnerable and weak. We pray for the prisoners and those who are detained uh, in this country and throughout the world. We pray tonight for uh, an instructive and engaging meeting and that throughout this meeting, we will continue to acknowledge you for all that you're doing and for all that you're going to do. This we do thank you for, and we welcome you into our presence. Amen. Now, have said that, I want to uh, introduce you to a colleague of mine who's going to take uh, us to our next steps, uh, Mr. Danny uh, Thornsby. Thank you so much, Reverend Larry, for uh, the beautiful prayer. As we begin, uh, we would like to, uh, first of all, just say thank you so much for uh, taking the time out of your evening to join us. Um, this is just to uh, share a little bit about who we are as Interfaith. So we at Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity is a California statewide organization of people of faith and congregations. We represent people of faith in Los Angeles County, the San Francisco Bay Area, and the Inland uh, Valley, San Bernardino, and Riverside counties. Our organization has been involved in the area of immigration, and criminal legal reform for many years. We also support people who are asylum seekers and those who face deportation. And we believe that everyone is sacred. So with, with that being, uh, we just wanted to share just a little bit of highlight of some of our work that we have done this past year in 2023. As you can see that these are some of the photos from our North Cal campaign, our 2023 North Cal pilgrimage, our ceasefire, love over fear concert, the home act advocates, our faith rooted organizing training in person, and our 2023 our holiday community potluck, and within our for our SoCal campaign is the Heal Dialogue in Atlanta, Ellensworth Pilgrimage, Border Experience Pilgrimage, Expungement Clinic, Clergy Breakfast, Immigrant Station of Cross in Atlanta. So these are just some of the uh, work that we had um, accomplished and some of it we are continuing to uh, focus on this coming year. And the, the purpose of uh, our campaign info session this evening is first of all, to welcome you all. And uh, we want to say thank you for struggling alongside of us in the work. We appreciate and value each of you. We appreciate your prayer and your generosity. We also appreciate you and value each of you. And please know that uh, we cannot bring about social change and justice without each of you. As the saying goes, until the great mass of people shall be filled with the sense of responsibility for each other welfare, social justice can never be attained. Mm -hmm. So this, this evening, we are grateful to share with you our goal and the campaign for the 2024 coming year and hope that you all continue or will become involved in the work. Hey everyone, um, I'm Reverend Deborah Lee, the Executive Director of Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity. Uh, I want to 
just say a word about how we understand ourselves in the amazing ecosystem of organizations seeking to transform the world. Um, we are a faith-rooted organization that is multi-faith, uh, multi-generational, generational, and multiracial. And we believe that we are most effective when we uh, truly live out those things together, guided by our spiritual values, organizing for systemic change, and utilizing the gifts of the faith community as part of a larger social movement. That's what we, we that's what how we understand uh, the sort of the, spe the specific power that we can bring as as people of faith in trying to transform the narratives that are out there, trying to transform the policies and the practices that impact people's lives, and trying to transform leadership, our own leadership and all of all of our leadership together. I want I've asked uh, Cindy McPherson, who is one of our I'm for HI leaders and um, been engaged with us uh, very deeply over the last year, if she could just give a reflection, a short reflection about what she sees as the power of faith-rooted advocacy. Thank Welcome. you, Rev Deb, and thanks, Kayla, for inviting me to reflect on why organizing with interfaith movement is what I like to do. Oh, I wanna switch to gallery so I see you all and not myself. There we go. Um, and thank you all for being here. It's so nice to see you. So I'll start by saying that for me, um, being grounded and connected to my spiritual self is so important for my health and well-being. And as I lean into that more, my spirituality calls me to take action for justice. But my upbringing my cultures, lineages, the community I come from is more reserved. And so having an organization that models activism and advocacy within a spiritual container is so important to me. Um, being with Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity, um, the organization brings ceremony and intention and contemplation to rallies. Um, it helps me to build relationships across difference and with other people who are grounded in their own spirituality. And all of this really calls me into action more um, by giving me community to join with. And then it's a generative cycle. So why I'm hooked, why I keep coming back is that um, personally engaging in spiritual practice makes me stronger to be able to face and to feel more and more the injustices and pains in the world and to move into action. And then when I take action with interfaith movement, it reinforces my spirituality and it gives me more spaces to practice in. And I appreciate some of the practices I've learned here, like solidarity, bearing witness, truth telling, as well as generosity and beloved community. And so allying with interfaith movement strengthens me and inspires me and supports me with community and then gives me opportunities for purposeful and meaningful engagement. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. That was really beautiful. I'm gonna share, um, we're gonna share some of our big, strokes of advocacy that we're focused on this year. And, and I'm gonna share about the immigrant justice work and many of this intersects. And I see a lot of you here on Ohlone land and you know the wonderful um, land back victory after many years that has taken place here. So obviously that's very interconnected as who we are as migrants, migrants and settlers um, on indigenous land as well. So I wanna share a little bit about our immigrant justice strategies, kind of like the overview of how we've been doing it and how we how we understand our work. The focus is on defending the dignity and, the, and reaching and advocating for the full participation of immigrants in our society, that your papers, your status, or the country you're born with should not matter in how you can fully participate in our world and our society. We are aware, um, one of our focuses is on changing the narrative because we are aware that in, in 
ugly political climate and an election year this year that a, a big part of our focus must be to defend and change the narrative, which continues to dehumanize immigrants and criminalize immigrants. It puts our neighbors and our friends and our families at risk, and it creates creates harmful policies and budget expenditures, which um, we have to live with for many decades to come. And sadly, it does nothing to address the real root causes that are driving forced migration. So our strategy focuses on how do we utilize the faith voice for advocacy. And this year, we can already anticipate this will be focused on defending asylum and the right of people from all over the world to seek protection. Um, ensuring that the U.S. respect its own laws and international laws in terms of migrant rights. Um, it will also mean advocating to stop the massive increases that are being proposed to the federal budget that would go to Border Patrol and Immigration, Customs and Enforcement for more detention, deportation, and border militarization. That instead, this kind of funding and expenditures should be put into programs such as accompaniment, case management, community services that would support newcomers to get off on the right foot. Um, this year, we um, have already heard that the Biden administration is proposing um, increases, including funding for up to 50,000 beds a night for immigrant detention. And this is actually historic Trump level highs of detention at a time that actually went down to like 15,000 during COVID and are already on the, about halfway to 50,000 already. Um, President Biden is also on the campaign trail dueling with President Trump for who can be the toughest on the border. So we will stand together and align our voices together to not allow immigrant lives of real people to become just another bargaining political bargaining chip. I want to turn it over now to Jose Rubin, who's one of our interfaith movement uh, faith leaders, who last year at this time was detained. Um, and we're so happy that today he's back home with his family and has you know, grown his organizing skills and is doing an incredible job organizing for the freedom of other people to talk about. Um, he'll be talking about our strategies to close detention centers and to stop deportation to keep families together. Thank you, Reverend Deb. Um, yeah, so hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jose Ruben Hernandez Gomez. I am 34 years of age. Uh, I have lived in Lodi, California since the age of three. Um, I'm a, uh, I'm a leader with the I am with I am for HI, um, and I, I can tell you that I have firsthand I, I have experienced abuse and mistreatment firsthand, and basically I was I was detained in three different facilities in California and Texas. Um, I could say that like these these inhumane facilities should not exist, first and foremost, right? Since they profit at the cost of immigrant suffering, um, and furthermore, detained immigrants are denied free legal representation for their immigration cases that deprives them of having their uh, a fair due process for their asylum cases that expedites a deportation at a large rate, violating immigrants' right to, li to life. Um, and that's why I am for each I is joining others in advocating AB 2031, which is a rep, uh, rep for all immigrants act. And this, uh, this act basically, this represent, this act basically, uh, constitutes the representation and equity and protections for all oh, for all immigrants acts uh, act seeks uh, to update the statutory language of the uh, one California California program which uh, by expanding the scope of immigration services and eliminating unjust exclusions for immigrants with previous contact with the the criminal system so basically this would um so this would give the opportunity for uh, for other for immigrants who who have served their 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 uh the what who have been released from CDCR and who are oh, or or incarceration right and and who are actually seeking asylum a lot of them are basically uh a lot of a lot of us are like such as myself is is uh we 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 fear of going back to our country of origin and without any representation basically puts us in a position where we can uh, you know suffer harm in our countries of origin without no without, without any legal representation so um so yeah so uh 
another strat uh that's why I basically I am for HI, which is uh has been uh has working has been working closely with the uh, dignity not detention to shut down the six remaining uh uh remaining facilities in California. Um so and that's why uh last year uh we were uh on last year's pilgrimage, uh, I could I want to speak about the uh, pilgrimage of last year. So, you know, I was fortunate to be a co-organizer for the uh, 2023 pilgrimage uh, that consisted of 50 people, in which 18 of them were directly impacted folks by ICE detention. Uh, we visited the six remaining facilities in California, as well as the Calexico Port of Entry and the San Diego border. Uh, we conducted visuals, testimonies. Uh, inform folks of the HEAL Act, which is uh, state funds that uh, can be used to divest from partial economies into jobs that can be that can be used into uh, for, for better jobs that can be uh, for our environment and local communities. Um, so at this year's pilgrimage, we will be revisiting these uh, these remaining detention centers, especially since uh, these detention centers uh, contract will be up for renewal. Uh, we want to support local uh, Local folks, uh, as well as well as active campaigns on shutdowns of of, of, of three active campaigns, uh, which is uh, GSA, Golden State Annex in McFarland, uh, Mesa Verde in Bakersfield, and Adelanto and Adelanto's uh, detention facility. Uh, as far as right now, we we know that Golden State Annex is, uh, which is in McFarland, is currently experiencing an increase of population. Uh, they started off with one hundred and thirty to now four hundred detained immigrants all from the border. Um, so we're starting to plan to for this year's pilgrimage. Uh, so I asked I asked y'all to to stay tuned for more details. Um, and I'll yes yeah, so thank you for thank you everyone for this uh, this opportunity for me to share and I'll, I'll pass it over to Lipiani for good evening good evening my name is Ipiani Lockert I am the Inland Empire Faith Organizer for Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity. Our regional director down here for the Inland Empire is Hilda Cruz. Right now, I'm going to be sharing a little about shutdown Adelanto. Um, Adelanto is a city in the high desert in San Bernardino County, which is the biggest county in this country, geographically speaking. The Adelanto Immigration Detention Center has for many years been one of the largest and most notorious for its poor record of treatment and medical neglect and death of loved ones being held within the, within the facility. There has been um, eight deaths thus far that we know of. And for those that are in the know, it's very hard to get, um, it's not always full transparency when it comes to immigrant detention centers or, or state facilities. Adelanto also has the largest, um, is the largest detention center as far as its bed capacity. A lawsuit that was filed against the Adelanto Detention Center because of its um, unsafe um, practices during the pandemic has resulted in the facility being pretty much um, not, you know, it's only six people being held currently right now in the facility, yet it's run as if it's at full capacity. So that means the staff is fully staffed, you know, all the lights are on, all the normal um daily operations are functioning as if it was at full capacity, which is a, a to me a huge waste of our um, resources and monies that can be better focused to um address the needs of our community and manifesting our the community's vision of a beloved community. Um the homeland security has um I indicated that Adelanto is under consideration for closure, yet however the GOP the GEO, I should say, which is um, the private owners of the prison, the GEO group, and um, Republicans are currently lobbying to keep the facility open. As Reb Dev had alluded to, in the midst of a uh, election year, we know that um, immigration is often one of these hot button topics, as well as um, you know, um, crime and and safety. You know, the 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 chance to lock them up and throw the key are definitely heard um, during these times. Ways that you are able to engage, as you see on the slide, is that you can um, participate in our upcoming Faith Power Hour for uh, Toronto. This will be happening February, March 22nd at noon. We encourage you to join and participate in this if you have a fire and a passion. 
that um, we would love to utilize your expertise and your lived experience to help us advocate for um, all of humanity. Another opportunity, you ha opportunity that you guys have to join us is that we have an in-person visual up there across the street from the Adelanto Detention Center. It is called Immigrant Station of the Cross. This will be happening March 29th from 10 a.m. to 12 noon. So if you're interested in attending or joining us, or if you know people within the area that may want to be present, we would love to be in contact with you to help spread the word about this amazing and powerful visual that we orchestrate. Thank you once again for your time. I'm at Biani Locker, and I'll be turning it over to our next speaker. Well, that would be me again. <laughs> so thank you, uh, Biani, uh, for sharing that. Um, yeah, so uh, now I, I want to just basically talk about like what uh, I am for HI, uh, how they, they uh, work for um, our freedom campaigns, right? Uh, as well as to stop deportations. Uh, so basically the freedom campaigns, you know, are the strategies on a campaign is basically bringing the outside support for folks inside detention, right? Such as uh, for those that are inside uh, fighting their immigration case, such as finding legal representation, uh, getting letters of support for them, uh, doing vigils for them, uh, accompanying families at virtual and physical court hearings, and contacting state reps, state representatives. Um, so those are the many ways that we, uh, I am for HI does, uh, you know, to for campaigns on on people who are are in in detention centers, and basically as well as like to stop deportations once they're you know they're 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 here or their cases are still pending, right? Uh, so now I would like to introduce you to uh, Floricel, uh, who we have been supporting her campaign to stop her deportation, that is threatening her to uh, permanently separate her from her family. Um, and I want to share about Floricel, right? Uh, Floricel has actually been a really special person to me because uh, she actually was supporting me in my freedom campaign along with I am for HI uh, while I was at, while I was in detention. Uh, she has inspired me and motivated me to not give up while while I was facing all these hardships while I was in detention and fighting my immigration case. Uh, matter of fact, I was actually ordered reported and she was telling me, don't give up, don't give up. Even though facing those 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 great challenges, she was there for me. So uh, today uh, I could say that she continues to be a, a great role model to me and our community. So, uh, yeah, just I wanted to just pass it over to our, our great community uh, leader, Floyd Sepp. ¿Ya puedo hablar? Sí, Floricel. Hola a todos. Hola a todos. Mi nombre es Floricel Iborio. Muchísimas gracias a todos por este espacio que me conceden. No sé si Denny está listo para que me interprete. Estamos listos. Uh, so like I mentioned in the chat, I will be um, interpreting Spanish to English. And so Floricel mentioned, hello everybody. My name is Floricel Iborio. And it's good to, to be here with you. And thank you. Por medio de este espacio, uh, estoy aquí para pedirle su apoyo. Uh, mi nombre es Floricel Iborio. Soy una mujer indígena uh, que he vivido más de 25 años aquí en California. I'm here today to ask for your support. My name is Floricel Iborio. I am an indigenous woman and I've been here for more than 25 years. Soy madre soltera de tres hijos. Um, en el 2012, migración deportó a mi pareja, dejándome con la responsabilidad de mis tres hijos menores de edad. I am a single mother of three. In 2012, my partner was deported by immigration, leaving me as the sole provider for my uh, children who were young. No dejó el vacío, uh, cual tomé la decisión, yo agarré la responsabilidad y enfrentar la vida como, como se me estaba presentando. Uh, tenía, tuve que tener 
dos trabajos, uno en la mañana y el otro en la noche. I was left empty and had to take the responsibility and face life after these challenges. I had to work in the morning and at night to make ends meet. Mi pareja era el sostén de la casa porque él corría con todos los gastos a pagar renta, pagar los biles y yo me encargaba de los niños. Previously, my partner was the sole provider for our household. He would make sure that we were able to pay for our rent and our bills, and I would care for my children. Uh, en, en la mañana trabajaba en un, en una, en un hotel haciendo limpiezas y en la noche trabajaba en un restaurante de comida rápida. In the mornings, I worked at a hotel as a housekeeper and at nights I worked at a fast food restaurant. Para que mis hijos no le faltara comida, los útiles que tenían que llevar a las escuelas, ropa para sus uniformes y fue muy difícil. And I did this so that my children can have food, school supplies, clothes, but it was very challenging. Debido a los, al tiempo que, al poco tiempo que yo estaba trabajando en los dos trabajos, no tenía el tiempo suficiente para brindarle a mis niños, para estar con ellos. And very quickly I noticed that while I was working, I ran out of time to be able to spend time with my children. Para ellos fue muy difícil no te, uh, la separación de, de su papá. Y a la vez no tener el apoyo mío porque yo estaba trabajando. It was very difficult for my children because not only were they separated from their dad, but now um, they didn't have as much access to, to their mom. Varios años estuvimos viviendo ese, uh, ese difícil tiempo. Uh, this difficult time lasted for multiple years. Cuando ya lo estábamos recuperando de todo eso, un día, un domingo familiar, saliendo de un restaurante, migración estaba uh, afuera eh, por mí. And one day, once we started to get back on our feet as we were exiting Uh, I hop restaurant. We were, I was detained by immigration. El impacto fue muy grande al tener que mis hijos vieran cómo arrestaban a su mamá, cómo la esposaban y cómo me 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 arrestaron frente de ellos. This was a very impactful moment for my children to see me getting detained, handcuffed by immigration. Sin saber qué iba a pasar conmigo, uh, sin saber qué, qué iba a pasar con mis hijos, a uh, migración me tuvo, me, me tuvo en diferentes detenciones uh, durante un año. And without knowing what would happen of me, without knowing what would happen to my children, immigration moved me from, at, from different detention centers. Durante un año, no estuve con mis hijos. Ellos no tuvieron una mamá. Ellos no tuvieron un papá. Prácticamente estuvieron solos. Eran menores de edad. For a whole year, my children were without their parents. They were just children under age. Fui liberada en el 2018. Uh, cuando salí de, de, de detención, fue grande el trauma que, sufri, que sufrieron mis hijos y el mío. Uh, a veces es muy difícil describir todo esto todavía. 
In 2018, I was able to fight for my liberation. And uh, I was able to leave detention. Upon exiting, I was able to see how impactful the trauma had been for me and my children. Still to de this que, day, it's very difficult. De que salí, he alzado mi voz, alzando mi caso. Mi caso ahorita lamentablemente está en unas condiciones muy, muy difícil, extremo de una deportación. Since I was able to get out, I have been organizing and fighting my case. But right now, my case is at risk of putting me in deportation proceedings. La comunidad me ha hecho fuerte y poderosa y tengo y quiero el uh, el apoyo para poner poder tener el poder para para seguir peleando mi caso. My community has given me the strength and the will and they support me and their support has helped me continue my fight. Tengo mi hija menor, ella tiene una indiscapacidad. Ella está en unos programas que es de por vida. Mi hija me necesita, mi comunidad me necesita. ¿Qué va a pasar si me deportan? ¿Cómo va a quedar, van a quedar mis hijos? Ya no voy a poder apoyar a la comunidad. I have a daughter who is differently abled and she, she's part of lifelong programs. How am I supposed to care? Who's going to care for her? What will happen to her and my kids? I need to be with my community so I can fight with them and organize. Ha sido el trauma tan grande y una tristeza tan enorme porque el trauma, el daño que le han causado a mis hijos, ellos son ciudadanos americanos y todo el daño que le han, le han causado su propio país, ¿quién va a pedirle perdón a ellos por todo lo que han pasado? There has been a lot of trauma, a lot of sadness uh, for me and my children. My children are U.S. citizens. Their own country has harmed them. And we don't know who's going to apologize and make up for this, this trauma to them. Gracias. Gracias, Richard. Por, por el tiempo, puedes uh, describir las acciones que las personas pueden tomar. Sí. Uh, pido el apoyo para hacer acciones de llamadas para el, para el congresista Barrett para que apoye mi caso y pare la deportación. Yo no quiero ser deportada, yo quiero seguir aquí con mis hijos y mi familia. And so the call to action is to help me by calling our representative Baron so that he can support my case. I don't want to be deported. Quiero seguir en la comunidad apoyando campañas, los cierres de detenciones. Quiero seguir apoyando para hacer un cambio y que muchas familias ya no, ya no pasen por el trauma que mis hijos y yo pasamos. I want to be in community so I can continue to organize and support campaigns to shut down detention centers to bring the change that we need. I don't want anybody else to go through what I through the harm and trauma that I, me and my family have experienced. Por favor, apoyen mi campaña, apoyen mi caso. A, a, unámonos a la acción de las llamadas. Soy una Please. madre desesperada. Please, I urge you to support my campaign. Make the phone calls. Um, I am asking uh, as a desperate Mother. Soy una, una madre desesperada que he vivido durante años todo este proceso. I am a desperate mother who has been experienced this for this uncertainty for years. Gracias, Floricel. Gracias.
Gracias a usted, reverenda, por el espacio y a todos los que me están escuchando un poco de mi caso. Thank you, Florizel, and thank you for everybody and for the reverend for giving me this space to share my, about my case. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Florizel, for sharing uh, your story. So um, if you all can, um, there's a bit.ly link right here that you can have access uh, to the toolkit. So pretty much the toolkit itself will uh, tell you uh, a little bit more about uh, Florizel's story and also ways to uh, take action. I think that um, one of our team members can share it on to the chat or send it uh, as a follow-up uh, email. So with that being, um, note that uh, it's very heart-wrenching what um, our uh, immigration and also just our system of injustice is doing to uh, our community members. And Florisel has really uh, shared, you know, her her story and a petition with us. And I know that it's very heavy. So let us take uh, a collective uh, breath and, and, you know, a silent prayer for um, a Florisel. You can stretch a little bit or you can just take a breathing. And regarding um, some of the questions that you may have, um, you can also like, you know, put it on the chat and uh, we make sure to uh, uh, um, answer some of your, your questions. With that being, uh, thank you, Floresel. We are uh, going to continue. Uh, and we're going to talk about uh, defending the dignity and full participation of those incarcerated, those impacted by incarceration. Uh, and uh, uh, I think Reverend Deb kind of uh, referenced uh, changing the narrative. Uh, and here with regard to incarceration and detention, uh, we need to change the narrative from uh, one being uh, ones whose focus is on punishment uh, and change the narrative and to humanize people, that people are human beings and that they needed to be treated with dignity and respect. And that uh, our work and our efforts, at least toward uh, decarceration, uh, is to create a world in where there is uh, alternative uh, solutions other than uh, jail and prisons. Uh, I would hope that one day to see that where prisons and jails are abolished altogether uh, and that people do live in beloved community. And I think there are ways of creating beloved community other than just uh, locking people up and uh, throwing the key away uh, and not uh, at least providing uh, opportunities for them to heal and to be restored back to their communities. Uh, tonight, uh, we're going to uh, proceed by talking about, are we at the uh, Life Without Parole? Is that the next one? So we have a special guest with us tonight, uh, and she's going to uh, share her story, a person who's been impacted by uh, life without the possibility of parole, which we uh, see as nothing more than second death penalty. Uh, we we'll want to welcome tonight Ms. Uh, Danielle Gray, and uh, we want to hear her voice, uh, hear her story in our own voice. Welcome, uh, Danielle. Thank you, Reverend Larry. And first and foremost, um, thank you for allowing me to share my story. So, so my name is Danielle Gray. Um, my husband, Marlon Gray, was sentenced to life without the possibility, possibility of parole and on August 5th, 1986. He was only 19 years old and being raised by a single mother with his siblings, two siblings, he was forced to turn to the streets, which led him to where he is. However, that's not him today. That's not Marlon today. Um, today, he's actually been accepted into the BA program with San Diego State University, which is at Sentinella State Prison. And it started in August of 2023. He was 
Prior to that, he was at Calipatria and he had uh, five associate degrees he completed there. And he is really into getting into the master's as well after he finishes the BA. So we have been married for um, 16 years and we have two kids. And there's a current bill, SB 94, that I know Reverend Larry will talk about in a second. But SB 94, it's going to allow Marlon to display the importance of rehabilitation, even facing this no chance to parole today, as we know. But he continues to participate in self-help motivation positive programming, and he devoted himself to being a positive member for others inside as well as outside, especially for our children. So we have a daughter, Aaliyah. She attends Fullerton Community College and she has a major in chemical engineering. Uh, we actually had her in sports and she was a fearless water polo player. She actually competed in the Junior Olympics. Mm -hmm. And so now she's graduated from high school and now she, she actually played for a Saddleback. And um, so she's doing very well. And our son, who's autistic, he just passed his real estate license and we're really proud of him. So every time when we visit, we take every moment possible to spend with him because as we know, it has no end, his sentence. But despite his sentence, our kids share their daily life encounters with him every chance when we go on visits and even calls. But as we know, it's not the same. When we visited him when we and back in Salinas, back in 2005, we actually had to write to the warden because he was autism, my son. And we had to get approval, bringing in homework. So really the kids were raised in the visiting room every weekend. And that was, that was what he did. And he did it really well because they are thriving young adults today. So the bill is important to me because I believe this gives Marlon and our family the opportunity to show he deserves this second chance. And we do know that this doesn't guarantee anything, but it's just a chance to have that hope. Um, you know, he's he just turned 57 this past February and he falls into that aging population that really does create concern for public health crisis that, you know, it costs to the state, right? We always talk about that, but yet he's still in there. Last year, when we were at Calipatria, he graduated from the youth mentoring program and he did a speech about change. And we got to take a picture with Jamel Carter and Jamel Carter is a heart uh, life coach. It stands for Hope and Redemption Team. And he really had a big impact on Marlon and he actually wrote a letter and said, hey, when you come out, you have a job with us. And ARC's uh, members are actually formally um, incarcerated. I don't use the word prisoner. That's not my vocabulary. And they go back in and they give hope to uh, our loved ones like my husband. Um, I really want to thank you for the invite because it's really hard for me to share this story. And so I really appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Danielle, Danny. Uh, uh, if, if I could see everybody's faces, I would ask you, doesn't that look like LeBron James in that picture? <laughs> well, some of you probably don't follow sports, but anyway, <laughs> kind of look like LeBron James. That's that's who I thought it was at first, and I was wrong. <laughs> but anyway, Danielle, thank you for sharing your story and being with us uh, tonight. Uh, I just want to say a little bit about SB uh, 94. The Senate Bill 94, it's a, it was a two-year bill, was actually put forward uh, last year. Uh, it was voted uh, on in the Senate, approved by the Senate. Uh, then it was tabled, and now it's been brought back this year. And it's going to be going before the House uh, Assembly, uh, maybe at late this month or next month. But at some point uh, within the next couple of months, this bill will be heard by uh, by the House and uh, if it's voted on uh, for the House, then it will become law, and we hope, certainly hope uh, that it will. 
The bill simply calls for judicial review for persons serving life without the possibility of parole and who have served 25 years more of their sentence. It provides an opportunity for a judge to determine whether a person who has had an extreme sentence will be eligible for resentencing for parole or release. And so uh, in order to help uh, move this bill along and encourage the assembly members to vote uh, yay on this bill, um, we want to, uh, we, we, we have two things. Uh, one, we have a letter that we've drafted. We are asking uh, faith leaders, uh, we'll be asking the uh, faith leaders to sign on to this letter. Uh, and um, we are asking that you sign on to the letter by April 4th, 2024. Yeah, April the 4th. And we ask you also that uh, you can uh, call, uh, contact your uh, your state or district representative and to encourage them uh, to support SB 94. This bill, by the way, is uh, authored by Senator uh, Cortese. So anyways, that's what we're working on, Senate Bill 94. This is just a step uh, toward uh, what we hope ultimately hope to abolish LWAP sentences altogether. As I said before, uh, LWAP is simply tant tantamount uh, to death by imprisonment. It's the second death penalty. That's all it is. Uh, and I believe with all my heart that that's overly punitive. Uh, that people, rather than punishing people, we need to try to restore people uh, and uh, restore them back to their communities and back to their families. Thank you so much, uh, Reverend Larry, for sharing. And thank you, um, Daniela, for sharing. Uh, we send our collective uh, breath and prayers to you and uh, send our love to you. So if any of y'all have any questions for Daniela, please uh, put them on the chat and uh, we'll make sure to try to uh, answer them. Thank you. Hello, this is Ipiani Lockard again. Inland Empire Faith Organizer to talk about the closed 10 um, prison campaign that we are in coalition with um, CURB and CURB is an acronym for California's United for Responsible Budget. But before I share that, I just wanted to reroute us in our faith values. Our faith values and spiritual practices that lead us to sustain action add a unique value to social movements by uplifting collective responsibility for social problems and our shared humanity. Faith is the source to address fundamental racial injustices in this country and move from fear, despair, and isolation towards collective action and hope. As you can see on the slide, the Curb 10, our California Close 10 prison campaign is one to announce at least 10 state prisons for closure for 2025. For those that are unaware, we are in a billion dollar um over $30 billion deficit here in the state of California. The reducing of these prisons would help um, free up a lot of money to better invest in life affirming services that heal and uplift our community and prevention as well to avoid um, running into incarceration or being incarcerated in one's lifetime. Also, the purpose of this is to reduce the prison population and keep it, and keeping an eye on transfer. So I wanna flesh that out a little basically meaning that um, when a prison is slated for closure, that we work to make sure that those that are held within the facility are transferred closer to their loved ones. We know that uh, there are much better outcomes when someone that is just as impacted is when they're connected to their community and when they're connected to, connected to their families. It, um, it speaks to that hope that Ms. Gray had spoke about earlier. Third, um, we would love to see the closure of these facilities, which would allow us to be able to have a cost saving of $1.5 billion and that we can transfer that money or utilize that money for community-based care. One way that you can um, take action to support the Closed 10 Prison Campaign 
is that you can take action by signing on to the organizational support letter supporting Senator Wahab's call for California Department of Corrections and Re Rehabilitation, better known to us as CDCR, to meticulously review their proposal for their 2025 budget with the aim of achieving a 15% reduction and a call for more, a call for additional closures of prisons. Um, this 15% reduction would save the state in excess of $2 billion in general fund spending, which we could uh, um, allocate to preserve our essential safety net programs that truly support the well being of all Californians. Next slide, please. As you see here, this is our prison closure campaign that we are focusing around Norco CRC. Just for reference, um, Norco is a city within inside um, within Re Riverside County. Riverside County is the third largest county in this country. So between San Bernardino County and Riverside County, um, the Inland Empire is a very vast territory. So um, if you got, so I, I have asked for you after I say these few things. But um, as you see on the slide, the, what's what's unique about this prison closure being constructed around Norco CRC is that the Norco leadership wants to see CRC close, which is very unique. Um, I, I would say more than unique, uh, almost an anomaly, because um, this is very rare. I've only seen it one time in my lifetime where the local leadership, the elected leadership, I should say, is in support of closure. Also. CRC is an antiquated facility or a very old, decrepit facility that would require over $80 million to update it. We see that as a terrible waste of money that we rather see the prison closed and see that money invested in the community. Also, it is known to have um, inhumane living and health conditions and is also located in a known fire zone. One thing that I wanted to um, highlight through one of the um, engagement strategies that we have around Norco CRC is um, our first phase that we did as a part of this prison closure campaign was called PLODS, which stands for Parking Lot Outreach Days. Those were orchestrated with um, in, 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 in partnership with the Curb Coalition, specifically um, L, um, Critical Resistance LA. We went to Norco CRC and set up shop outside of the facility to engage with loved ones from August to December 2023 of last year. And we were able to connect with over 120 family members. One person that we were able to connect with was a young man by the name of Matthew that recently shared his lived experience being housed in Norco CRC a few years ago. And he brought to our attention, some of the um, horrible things that are happening within inside the facility. There's a known drug problem within the facility with a number of overdoses um, happening. Now, as I alluded to earlier, it's really hard to get so rock solid numbers because there's a lack of transparency throughout the whole CDCR system throughout the state of California. He also spoke about um, when the People held with inside, held within Norco CRC, raise issues about the guards or things that are not being conducted right. Often the guards will take away things from their cellmates, which in turn relates to them being targeted by their cellmates and often brutally beaten as the guards turn a blind eye to these atrocities that they have orchestrated themselves. Now we're in the second phase. The first phase was our plot. Now we're in our second phase of um, community and organizational support and engagement. From the community vantage point, um, we have been conducting a series of webinars and listening sessions with the family members, the over 120 family members that we were able to connect with. One is to center their voices and identify their needs. Two is to help guide them towards resources and resentencing tools that may be beneficial to their loved ones. For example, the Racial Justice Act for All is something that um, we have been sharing about as well. And then three is to identify the community's vision of a beloved community, and as well as identify ideas of what Norco CRC can be repurposed into. What is their vision for the community? What investments do they wanna see in, in their community? What do they need for their community to thrive? From the organizational phase, is a part of phase two, we are in the midst of organizing um, meetings with organizations and congregations around Norco CRC. 
The immediate cities around Norco are um, East Bell and Corona, but we are connecting with uh, congregations and organizations throughout Riverside County in, in hopes of building up support for the prison closure campaign, because ultimately it has to come from the people. You have to have the people have to raise their voice and utilize their energy if they really want to see prison closure. So we are here to help um, help guide them in advocacy and empower them through resources and be by their side as we march together for the closure of Norco CRC. We recently just had a meeting with um, California Safety and Justice, their IE Excuse chapter. me, Tipiani, we're going to have Yes, ma'am. Can we, can we move on to the, is there a particular ask? on? This I got meeting? the call to action right here. There we go. Yes, the, the way that you can take action with this is by um, supporting a petition that will be circulating in the very near future. And um, we'll make sure that we include that to um, you in our follow-up email. Next slide, please. This slide right here is um, pertaining to ACA 8. We wanted to uplift the amazing work that um, legal services for prisoners with children and the All of Us or None statewide network is raising. Um, ACA 8 is a, is a bill, let me get to the screen. Yes, it's um, basically the purpose of ACA 8 is ending slavery in California. The California constitution prohibits slavery and prohibits involuntary servitude except for the punishment except as a punishment to, to crimes. This measure would prohibit slavery in any form, including forced labor, labor compelled by the use or threat of physical or legal coercion. Last year, over 65% of incarcerated people reported being, for, reported being forced to work in prisons, doing vital jobs like firefighting, paving roads while the government and private companies generate and save collectively at least $1 billion each year from their labor. We wanted to lift this up. And if you want to um, find out more about ACA 8 and how you can support, we would um, we would love to provide you with a very amazing and in-depth toolkit that was compiled by um, LSPC, which is Legal Services for Prisoners with Children, as well as if you know any organizations, congregations, or or individuals that have a passion for abolition or prison closure, if you could point us in um in their direction to engage and connect with them, because as mentioned, um Riverside County is the third largest county in the country. So thank you for your time. I greatly appreciate you, and um, I'm passing it on to our next speaker. Thank you, Rubiani. Uh, yeah. So we have shared a lot of information. So we're just gonna take this moment to kind of like really quickly breathe, take a collective breath, stretch. And if y'all have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll make sure to uh, answer them. And next uh, we'll transition to uh, some of our uh, local work that we're working on here in uh, NorCal. Thank you, Danny. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Gayla King. I'm the Northern California Regional Director with Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity. Um, so I think many of us or all of us on the call are sharing in the heartbreak as we enter the six month um, of the Israeli bombardment in Gaza. We continue to mourn although lives that have been lost, the over 1,100 Israelis that were killed on October 7th, the over 30,000 Palestinians who've been killed in Gaza, more than 13,000 children, the over 500 Palestinians killed in the West Bank. And with that heartbreak, we've been really inspired and taken direction from a lot of Palestinian faith leaders um, calling us into action, calling us to be more visible with our faith in solidarity. So part of that effort, um, we're working with other faith communities and American Friends Service Committee, inviting faith communities to put up a banner that says, love demands permanent ceasefire now. Currently, we have over a dozen around the Bay Area who've lifted a banner, often accompanied with a prayer, an interfaith prayer and ceremony. 
Um, and we are inviting more faith communities to join us until we can get a permanent ceasefire. So we'll share a link to that. If you're not, not in the Bay Area, um, we're happy to share with you steps you can take for your congregation to engage in discernment and, and to order and print a banner. Another way that we're responding is by joining, oh, next slide please, Danny, is um, joining a global effort um, to participate in a ceasefire interfaith pilgrimage. Um, this has already been happening in over 145 cities um, and 18 countries around the world where people are um, are engaging in pilgrimage. And for many of you, many, all of us in different faith traditions, we know the power of, of pilgrimage and what that means um, to take to the streets, to turn our grief and rage into action. Um, and this is being done, joining the global effort that are calling for four demands for an enduring and sustained ceasefire, for the immediate flow of life-saving aid, to release all hostages, and to end the occupation for a just peace. So on March 23rd, we will be partaking in this. We will be using our bodies to map Gaza onto the East Bay. Um, it will begin in the morning in Berkeley, um, and the, the path will follow through the shell mound that we're so all very happy that that land is going to be rematriated and it'll be stopping at various congregations along the way and ending in Alameda. So we are inviting faith communities to participate, to sign up. You don't have to do the whole 22 miles unless you want to um, and join us on that day to, to take part in this global effort. Next slide, and I think we'll put all the links in the chat. Um, another campaign I wanted to just lift up that we are um, really excited. We received funding from the Bay Area Creative Corps to bring on three cultural strategists um, who will be with our team infusing art and culture into campaigns that are um, really looking at how our communities of color in Oakland are, um, are facing ongoing economic inequality and public violence that really are straining our connections and hinder collaborations. So um, with the help of these artists, we're going to be bringing podcasts where we're going to hear from community leaders um, on what love looks like in Oakland. Um, for, for safety. We're gonna have a photo series that will also lift up um, people who are experiencing and embodying love in our communities and music with um, one of the cultural strategists will be, will be doing concerts in the Fruitvale. We've just launched the Unveiling Love podcast with an interview with Reverend Deborah Lee. Um, we can put a link to that in the chat as well so you can hear our vision for what how do we embody love in Oakland? And we just invite you to, if you're not in the Bay Area, to, to follow the podcast. And if you are local, we would love for you to join us at the um, photo series and for any of the concerts that will be upcoming. And with that, I will turn it over to Deb, but please drop any questions you have for me in the chat. Okay, you all have been very quiet. I know we haven't given you a lot of time to talk, but I, we really do want to know. So this is coming up. I'm just like a filler slide right now, but we really do want to know any your reflections or what is this prompting in you? Um, how might you know what's exciting you? What or you know about what we're sharing? What might you want to be interested in? Um, so one thing I want to share, and one very basic way and really important way that you can support this collective work and our dreams for the coming year is to 
help sustain, help sustain the organizing, help sustain the advocacy work. Uh, we have a monthly sustainer program and we have over a hundred people who contribute to interfaith movement on a monthly basis, donating between $5 and a hundred dollars a month. Um, and, you know, we'd really, if you believe in this work, we ask you to continue to partner with us in this really concrete way and to consider we're in our sustainer drive this month of March. So if you could become a sustainer for this year to an, in an amount that feels generous to you, um, whether it's like a, a, a coffee or a latte or um, something that's a dinner, a dinner with a loved one, um, and you could support that to show your love for the work of collective freedom and what we can accomplish together that helps us to sustain and to be able to plan for and to be able to know that we're going to be here by the end of the year and continuing to do this work. Because a lot of this work, as you know, is long-term shifts and change. So I hope that you can enjoy our sustainer drive. Um, we also have a little survey, which will, if you can spend a few minutes to fill out, um, is like a response survey of what what of what we've talked to you about today, um, what of the campaigns that we've mentioned most resonate with you, and which ones can we know can we follow up with you about and organize with you and co-plan with you, and which ones which are the advocacy and lobbying work that you want to do together with us. So I hope that you can spend a few minutes to to tell us how you'd like to be involved. Next slide. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, just like Reverend Deb said, we do want to hear feedback from you guys about what you want to be involved in, what other areas you'd like to support. So please fill out those surveys if you can. Um, but basically, I just want to introduce myself first. Hi, I'm Felicia Hyde. I'm the communications manager with Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity. And I know that that was a lot of information that was kind of thrown at you within this first hour, um, but we hope it wasn't too overwhelming. And just like the rest of the staff had mentioned that there's been a lot of strides already within the first couple of months of 2024, but there's so much more to come. And so part of that, we encourage you all to follow us on our social media from Instagram to Facebook. And we'll also include those links into the chat as well, just so you can stay up to date of what's happening, following the Love Over Fear project and many of, many of the other campaigns that were mentioned prior. Um, on top of that, if you're new, or you haven't been getting any um, updates or information from us, we also invite you to uh, stay informed and sign up for our e-newsletter uh, to be sent out to you on a regular basis, just so you, again, can be up to date on receiving the latest news on programs, other initiatives and events uh, coming for the year. And so basically hoping that you can join that and continue the work to amplify collective freedom with us and uplift other um, our beloved communities as well. So thank you. Yeah, so with that being, um, there was a lot of information that was shared with you all, and I'm sure that you all have a lot of um, thoughts, reflections, or a question around it, so uh, let us hear from you. Um, we would like to hear from you. You can just um, either raise your hand or unmute yourself and just share. Uh, good evening. This is Melvin. I'm from the First Year U Church. Um, I guess I'm interested. I'm going to do the walk on the, hopefully on the 23rd, not all of it. Uh, we're hosting your housing forum next Thursday on the 21st. And then um, I will add the uh, I'm for Human Integrity back to our, our work on the uh, grants committee. And we give out grants to community groups. So I'll add your uh, name to the organization again this year. Thank you so much, Melvin. That's Melvin, thank you for fundraising for us and thank you for connecting your congregation, being a connecting point with your congregation. I will look forward to seeing you on the 23rd. We're not encouraging anyone to walk the whole 22 miles in one day, just to be clear, but we hope to see you for one leg. 
Yeah, I couldn't do I could do twenty two miles. I could back in my youth, but not now. <laughs> Anyone else want to just share any comments, reflections, other thoughts or ideas? Any questions for our speakers? Letitia. Yes, uh, <clears throat> my name is Sister Letitia Boards. Uh, I belong to the Society of Helpers. It's uh, it's an international congregation of women religious, but we're very few in the United States now. There are only 13 of us in the United States, but my community is all over the world. I just want to say um, I'm 87 years old, so I've been at this for a long time. And um, I, I am so moved by the work that the Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity is doing. And what I think is so precious about it is that it's an interfaith movement and that we're all in this together. And also the fact that it's a movement. I mean, we have to be together with, you know, the, the, where the, the motivation is clear, the purpose is clear, and certainly the presentation tonight was so good in outlining what is planned for this year. It makes it, uh, it makes it possible for people to say, oh, I can do this or I can do that. So at my age, I can't you know, say, oh, I'm gonna organize this, I'm gonna organize that anymore. It's left to others. But I'd like to, con to contribute where I can. And right now, I'm inviting people to be on that Gaza pilgrimage because, uh, to me, Gaza is, is heartbreaking. So this is where I'm putting my effort for the next two weeks. But again, I want, I want to thank you for the wonderful work you're doing. Thank you so much, Leticia, for uh, sharing and just also uplifting the work that Interfaith is doing as well. It's really appreciated to know that it's, you know, going into fruition and seeing actually the seeds that are being planted. So thank you for uplifting the uh, pilgrimage as well. And then uh, we also had some other hands that were raised. I see uh, Martha. I'm kind of overwhelmed by all that you are doing in a very good way. I have been worried about Oakland, and so I'm so pleased that you're doing what you can to bring a less violence, to help people there do what they can for less violence, because it's possible in that community. I also write to a person who is in prison in Michigan, and she should be let go. She should be on parole. She should be out, and she's not. So I understand. I suffer with her. Not as much as she does, of course, but it's painful for me that she's forever in prison. And of course, immigrants, and I work with immigrants too. So although I'm, for various reasons, health and age, I'm not able to do a lot. But I'll see what I can do about money, which isn't, I can't do much of that. But I am so happy and so pleased and amazed at all that you do. It's amazing to me all that you're doing with a number of people there. I'm just, and I'm so impressed with people who work with you and how you help them to be able to direct a meeting and do things. It's, it's a marvelous organization. I'd say one of the best I've ever been part of. Thank you. Thank you, Martha, for sharing all of that. And also, again, uplifting the work that we do to know that it's actually making a difference and it's really appreciated, and as well as uplifting Oakland in that space. And so thank you as well. And so folks, I know people are like, oh, I can't participate or I can't contribute. The little things matter. So any help that's provided is appreciated. So thank you so much. 
Um, and then I know we had some other hands that were raised. I think Larry, you were one of them. You're oh, muted, Larry. Larry. You're on mute. me. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, Jose Ruben. Oh yeah, gracias. Thank you, Felicia. No, I just wanted to, like my reflections. Uh, I could say that like being that uh for myself that I was you know, in detention for a long period of time, um, and knowing that interfaith movement for human integrity was basically uh. Or, you know they were they were doing my campaign from the from the outside right and what basically contributed so much to my liberation um and being that uh, now that I'm now that I've been, I've been I'm I'm free and released and and I'm I'm given the opportunity to to uh to be involved and to like better my skills and, and my leadership you know um I believe that like this is like I'm I'm just a it's a huge huge blessing and I believe that like you know through all, you know, knowing what interfaith movement uh, for human integrity has been doing, and and seeing the w wide range of scope of how uh, where they're you know what they're focusing on, uh, just gives me like a just broadens my mind and and, and what and my interest in in advocating for in different forms, right? Such as you know the you know the, what's going on in Gaza, what's going on with you no know, you know form you know people who are in, incarcerated and in prison and and you know. People who are just going through so many injustices, and it's just like a, it's it's just it's amazing, just what you know, everything they do, just the accompaniment. You know I mean, for people who who are in dire need of, of assistance. So, um, you know, I just wanted to just you know thank y'all for you know everybody here. And I mean, it's just like you know we we all we're we're we're, we're that we're part of that body. You know what I mean, you know. So, um, and I feel like every you know we're all we're all a contribution to to this movement. And I just I'm just deeply appreciate to to for y'all to just see having the interest of you know you know of 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 those that are basically that are in dire need of help. So thank you all for, for this, this great opportunity and that and God bless. And blessings to you as well, Jose Ruben. Thank you also for being a part of the presentation and you know speaking on behalf of Floricel's campaign as well and sharing all the work that you've done. And it's been a great just contribution and addition to the team to have you on board with us. So thank you. And I know there's a lot of other hands and questions, so feel free also if there's um, if you have to go to uh, put that in the chat as well. Um, and then Danny, I do see your names also raised or hands also raised. You know, I I just want to thank Jerry uh, Silva for um, introducing Reverend Larry to me because we met last a couple months ago at a convening for the fuel organizers. And I am actually part of the SA Justice Group as well, which is a sisterhood, women support for impacted women um, that have loved ones. And I actually was recently canvassing in front of Men's Central Jail, trying to get that jail closed and talking to women impacted the stories. It's very, um, this is one thing that I do on the side that I do a lot of canvassing with women impacted. And so I do facilitate some help, a support group for women only, as well as some other fellowships trying to get, uh, you know, the vending bill passed. And we have some other bills because when I do visit my husband, I see a woman that reminds me of me that didn't know anything that was almost embarrassed to even say where I was. And that was 16, 17 years ago. But today I freely speak at rallies. I'm very proud of my husband. I'm very proud of the community and very strong link arms with a lot of nonprofits. I'm very familiar with Curve and the fight. And so a lot of nonprofits really do believe in abolitionists, you know, that just, just link arms. So I am so appreciative in being part of this and I will sign up. I'm already signing up, but I can't wait to be part of the movement. So I appreciate everything that you folks do. Thank you so much, Danny, for sharing that. I almost, I was also crying too. Um, but just know that we're here for um, in support of you. We're here to support your husband, your family, and that you have a team behind you that is working its way to make sure that things are actually better. <laughs> and so just thank you also for being present with us and sharing your story as well. And 
just letting us know more about uh, how to help in any way that we can. And so thank you. And thank you to everybody that's uh, present. If there are any other questions, we do have about seven minutes on our time with, together. And so feel free to also add that into the chat or raise your hand or just unmute yourself if you'd like. If there's none other, we could go to our closing that Danny will lead us in. I do hope there's a couple, just as a reminder, a couple quicker things I hope you can do tonight. Um, one is to sign that SB 94 faith letter. Uh, we just launched it and we've got three weeks. Uh, we hope to get several hundred signatures as that bill will be heard in the state legislature. Um, and then to sign Florida Cell's petition, that's another time sensitive thing. And then of course, to fill out our engagement survey. So just as a quick reminder, thanks. Yeah, thanks Reverend Deb. Thanks everyone. And uh, thank you all for joining us uh, this evening. Um, I did forgot to um, introduce myself. So my name is uh, Danny Thongsi. I am a faith organizer here in uh, NorCal uh, with Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity. So just a little bit about myself. I am a formerly incarcerated um, community leader. I was given a life sentence when I was a juvenile and I, I served 20 years out of um, a life sentence. And uh, when I was gonna come home, I would transfer to immigration for deportation and uh, when I got out of a uh, deportation proceeding, I um, I parole here in the Bay Area, and uh, Reverend Dev and Interfaith was there to uh, you know support me in my uh, leadership here in the community. Then also uh, I had a pardon campaign running uh, ran for me to uh, get clemency from Governor Newsom in two twenty in. 2018. So in 2020, uh, with the help from Interfaith and our other uh, allies, I was granted a uh, clemency from uh, Governor Newsom, which means that I'm no longer under the threat of deportation. And because of that, I am currently, you know, here working for Interfaith and at the same time um, working on uh, finishing up my bachelor degree at UC Berkeley. So just wanted to share that a little bit about uh, who I am and the work that Interfaith has done is really impactful and has really uh, touched and changed my life and also given me the opportunity to uh, um, serve within the community. So with that being, um, I just wanted to invite you all in our closing prayer. Um, before we do, uh, let us uh, humble our hearts, our minds, and uh, ourselves as we come before the Holy One. But first of all, we want to uh, acknowledge that the land that we are on belongs to the indigenous people. Here in the San Francisco Bay Area, it is the Ohlone, the Chocheno, the Ramatus, the Yukos, the Mu Wikman tribe, and we want to thank them and their ancestor for allowing us to uh, to be here as guests. When I say as guests, um, I'm saying that no matter how many generations that we are here in in the state, we we are still considered guests. And um, as we live and pray in this land, we want to acknowledge that, and we thank them for that. We also want to acknowledge that this is the holy uh, season of Lent, the holy season of Ramadan. And we also want to acknowledge any holy days and season of all collective and sacred practices. We, um, we continue to lift, lift uh, Palestine. We lift up Gaza. We lift up um, families there. 
but we lift up um, those who lost their lives. We lift up both our Jewish and Palestinian community. We pray for a release of hostages. We pray for a ceasefire. We pray for love. We pray for provision. We pray for broken hearts to be men. We pray for those on the street and those who put their bodies and hearts on the line for justice, love, peace, and liberation. We pray for the struggles and conflict that is in the world. We pray for those who hunger, those who thirst, and those who are without shelter and without clothing. We pray for each other. We pray for our hearts, our mind, and our body. We pray that we will be led by love, the spirit of love, to practice hospitality, to struggle with those who struggle, to cry with those who cry, and to hurt with those who hurt, and to love with those who love. We are reminded that injustice anywhere is a, th is a threat to justice everywhere. So we uplift one another to be vessels, to bring love, peace, healing, transformation and collective freedom in the world. In all this, we pray. Amen. Ashe. I mean, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Danny. That was a beautiful prayer. Yeah. Really Thank beautiful. You so much. Danny.